Ball State Sports Link's third down chirp is delivered by Papa John's. Better ingredients, better pizza. Visit PapaJohns.com today for more info. that doesn't get you excited for Ball State football, then something is wrong with you. Welcome back to another great edition of Third Down Chirp, delivered by Papa John's. I'm your host, Luke Martin, alongside the true talent of the show, Zach Hughes, Tyler Bradfield. Fellas, football season has finally kicked off, and it couldn't have happened probably in a better way if you're a Ball State fan. Ball State gets a huge win at home over Illinois State, a great way to start the football season. You know, it's just great to be back out at Schumann Stadium, Zach, but even better when Ball State gets a win. It was great to be back out at Schumann Stadium and get that big win against a very good Illinois State team that we talked about last week. So let's focus on that game last Thursday by going through our opening drive with our three main headlines of what transpired, of what we believe happened in that game. Zach, what kind of stood out to you about Ball State's win against Illinois State? Well, Luke, going back to what you talked about last week with how much talent this FCS team in Illinois State had, we looked over what transpired last week and seven FCS team took down FBS teams this weekend, including Eastern Washington. They beat number 25, Oregon State. But what makes it even more impressive is that FCS teams only have 63 scholarships as compared to the 85 that FBS teams get. And all these games are at the FBS team school, so home field advantage for the FBS team. Just a very good win for Ball State to get a win over Illinois State. What stood out to me was turnovers, and something that Ball State struggled with all last year, Zach, was turnover margin. And they you know, we're in the negative side of it. They're plus two on turnover margin already, and when uh, they do commit no turnovers under Coach Limbo, they're 9-0. No turnovers last week. Ball State gets the win over Illinois State. Turnovers is always that statistic that coaches circle at the end of the game because odds are if you won, you won that turnover battle. For me, it was just a tale of two halves, guys. It was a game that did not go Ball State's way at all in that first half, and all of a sudden, the second half, whatever Coach Limbo said in the locker room, he keeps saying it. Last year, they were plus 68 on points against their opponents in the third quarter. Something that Coach Limbo is saying in that locker room is working. Phenomenal job, a tale of two halves for sure when you're looking at Ball State and Illinois State. Well, let's relive that game and go through the highlights here with our Sounds of the Game segment. As we'll hear the radio calls from Tyler Bradfield from his broadcast on the student radio station here at Ball State 91.3 WCRD as we relive that Ball State win over Illinois State. Hello everybody and welcome to Schumann Stadium on the campus of Ball State University for the 2013 college football season opener between the Ball State Cardinals and the visiting Illinois State Redbirds. Leave is Marshawn Coffridge. Takes the snap, hands it off to Coffridge as he pounds his way in. Check that, that was Colin Koshane. And Koshane will be into the end zone for an Illinois State touchdown, the first of the 2013 season. Clark rolling as Ball State will take the snap as the quarterback sneak by Keith Winning. And Keith Winning is into the end zone off to our right, into the south end zone. Fireworks going off to the south of Schumann Stadium. Wide receiver in either direction in the backfield, I believe, is Marshawn Coppridge. Jared Barnett under center. Four-man front takes the snap. He's going to turn around, fake the handoff, looks to pass to the left side. He's got Oshinesti in between. It went through, though, to the open wide receiver. I don't know how it got through. It was Anthony Warren bringing it in. He goes all the way to the Ball State end zone for a touchdown. Jamil Smith, two yards deep in his own end zone, will bring it out in between the hash marks to the 20 to the 25, 30. Has a blocker in front of the 40 on the near sideline. Dodges the tackler across the 40 to the 40 to the 30 to the 20. Misses a tackler inside to the 20, and he's all the way down to the 10 yard line. It's Jamil Smith. An impressive kickoff, almost went for six. 
Bruce Barnett will take the snap from the I formation. He'll fire to the right, and it's got for a touchdown for this Illinois State offense. It's Matt Myers in his right. Takes the shotgun step back to pass. Good protection sets up. Looks to his left. He fires to Jordan Williams, and Williams has it into the end zone. It's a touchdown for Ball State. Jared Barnett under center, takes the snap, pulls away, five-step drops, throws over the middle, it's deflected by Eric Patterson, but then it's deflected and picked off by the middle linebacker, Ben Engel. Runs for Illinois State as he moves Zane, fakes the motion from left to right, takes the snap, back to pass, he's got Willie Sneed over the middle to the 20, Sneed to the 10, Sneed going in, and he will score for the Ball State Cardinals with 3.47 to play in the third quarter. Touchdown Ball State and Willie Sneed. Ball State with the football on the right hash mark. Winning will hand it off to Jawan Edwards. He pounds his way to the goal line. Did he get in? He did. Ball State will score once again. It's Jawan Edwards from about six yards out. A handoff from Keith winning to Jawan Edwards. Shows the final score from Schumann Stadium in week one. Ball State 51. Illinois State 28. A good win for the Ball State Cardinals. Ball State wins their third straight season opener under head coach Pete Limbo, which is the first time Ball State has won three straight season openers since 1975 to 1977. Once again, guys, another milestone broken for this team under coach Limbo. Just real quickly again, what stands out when you look at those statistics and the final score? Well, Ball State only had a total of 80 yards rushing on the game, but Jordan Hansel, the only returning offensive lineman this season, he didn't play until the second half. So I know the running game will get fixed, but Second half, Jordan Hansel comes back in and provides some support. The score doesn't really represent what the game was in the first half. Really, it's a tale of two halves in this one. And Ball State really struggled in the first half to get on the same page. But in the locker room, they got things situated. They got things figured out, came out in the second half, rolled 42 unanswered points to a 51-28 win. Another thing, guys, to look at was rushing yards for Illinois State. First time ever in the limbo era that they held a team under 100 yards rushing. Phenomenal job by Coach Jay Bateman, which we'll get to Coach Bateman here later on in the show. There's always that moment in a game where you're like, wow, the game changed at that moment. Well, it's called the turning point, and we're going to pick our turning point for the game against Illinois State. Zach, what was that moment for you where you were like, this went in totally Ball State's favor right after that point? Well, it was right after halftime. In fact, it was the first scoring drive out of the half. They winning hit Snead in a nine-yard touchdown pass, but a play that was more important on that drive previous to that play is Ball State converted a second and 16 with a 50-yard pass to Willie Snead. That was after... Winning had already been stacked. It was a huge momentum swing, and it gave Ball State the first lead of the game. So the scoring drive right out of the half, very important for Ball State. What came, my turning point in the game was slightly after that. At around the three-minute mark in the third quarter, it was a nine-point game for Ball State. And then Illinois State dropped back with Jared Barnett and an interception by Ben Engel. That kind of sealed the deal. It was a nine-point win. Five plays later, Keith Winning punched it into the end zone. That was the turning point, the interception by Ben Engel. And you're watching it right now on the screen as you see Ben Engel as he got a little bit of help there from Martez Hester and returned it in, which that was also a targeting penalty, one of the new rules the NCAA implemented. For me, my turning point was that Jordan Williams touchdown right before the end of halftime. I got Coach Limbo as he was going into the locker room. He said that play was huge for us as you watch it right now on the screen. It just changed the momentum. There was no momentum going for Ball State until that moment. At that point in time, they came out to start the second half, drove right down the field, scored, totally changed the complexion of the game, not just for all the offense, but Ball State only allowed one touchdown the rest of the way from Illinois State's perspective, and that was against the second-tier group for Ball State. So a phenomenal job by the Cardinals. Well, that's, that's done with Week 1, boys. Now it's time to focus on Week 2, and it's against the Army Black Knights. So let's meet this Black Knight squad as they're all the way out in West Point, New York, the United States Military Academy. It's a little bit of a ways away from Muncie, Indiana and Schumann Stadium, just under 700 miles. As you can see right there, we're Mikey Stadium. They will be making that trek all the way out to play ball state here at Schumann Stadium. But for the first time since 2010, Army won their season opener. Guess what happened, guys, the last time they did that? It was when they went bowling in 2010. So this Army Black Knight team, they are coming in with a whole bunch of confidence. And the look more in-depth from an Army Black Knight perspective, who knows better than the play-by-play -play voice of the Army Black Knights with our behind-the-mic segment with the voice of the Black Knights, Rich DeMarco. It's interesting because I think over the past few years, we've always wanted to and looked forward to seeing some type of 
consistent passing attack supplement that tremendous triple option. This is an Army team which led the nation in rushing one year ago. And what this offense has been seeking is a big target on the outside that's been able to take some pressure off the running backs and the offensive linemen trying to open up these holes. And by the looks of game number one, Xavier Moss, just a tremendous-looking freshman, might just be that big receiver. Had two catches for 75 yards, including a big 51-yard reception and a beautiful 24-yard catch on his first offensive play as a collegiate player. And someone like Moss, who's all of 6'4", who can make those catches, it might be that type of receiver. If Army can get him the ball consistently, and Angel Santiago, who really – didn't play much at all last year, was third string for most of the year. It's quarterback. We saw Friday, the most we've seen from him really in two years, he was able to get the ball on the outside, get it to Moss, and that's potentially the biggest difference in this offense. This Friday, this past Friday night, the win over Morgan State was the first win for Army in a season opener since 2010. Ironically, maybe not ironically, that season Army went to a bowl game, which was its first bowl game in 14 years, first bowl win in 25 years. You can't underscore just what picking up a victory means, even if it was only, maybe some might say, a 16-point victory over Morgan State. How many FCS teams upset FBS teams this past weekend? Just getting that first one under your belt, talking to these players this week, to a man, to a player, just being 1-0. and They haven't been 1-0 since 2010, so most of these players – have never won their opener. So I think a defensively, just some kind of consistent pass rush, I believe, is, is going to be a huge, huge key on Saturday. Huge thanks to Rich DeMarco for talking to us from the Black Knight perspective. Now let's flip it. Let's see what the Ball State Cardinals think about this Army Black Knight team by going to our coordinator's corner as we caught up with Rich Skrowski from the offensive side, Jay Bateman, our defensive coordinator, and also, they know that this Army Black Knight team, it will be an extremely tough test. Both sides of the ball present unique challenges. And on the defensive side of the ball, they're really unique in that they play basically a run defense. They play a one high safety shell, which by numbers you'd say throw the ball every snap. But at the same time, you can't throw the ball every snap because of the nature of the offense. So we have to do a good job of running the ball. The ball's got to get hit by the unblocked guy. And I know that doesn't sound real logical, but as long as we get it to that person, I think our run game will be fine. And in the pass game, we got to be, uh, you know, I, I was looking at two years ago tape as well as last year. And uh, the key to our pass game was consistency. I, I think Keith has been somewhere around 75% over the last two years against these guys. And we have to be, we had to complete the balls in front, the hitches, the slants, you know, the inside uh, inside routes. And uh, as long as we do that and we stay on track, I think we could be okay. I mean, I think it's one thing to go from a team that's a two-back run team to a, you know, a one-back that's going to throw it a little bit more. You know, but this is such a different animal. It's, it's a real challenge. You know, the, 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 the advantage we have is we have some kids that have done it for two years now. So there's a decent amount of carryover. And we play them early, so we're able to practice it a little bit in preseason, but it's a huge challenge. My gut is they think Santiago can throw it a little bit better, you know, so I think that's part of it. I think they got a little bit better, a little bit better at receiver. Uh, but I think what's going to, what really makes them a challenge to defend is I think all three of their running backs are good players. And I think last year, you know, the Baggett kid got hurt and, uh, you know, they, they kind of were, it was Mr. Inside, Mr. Outside with Maples and Dixon. So I think now all three of them are good. The quarterback runs good. So it's, I mean, it's hard. It's, it's going to be a challenge for us. Coach Limbo says told them all week long. I mean, I think with our start, I mean, we start bad against these guys. It's going to be a hole now, and that's going to be a bad situation. So we got to start great. Um, we had a three and out against them the first two years. That's, that's our goal, the first drive of the game. And then I think we've got to be able to handle, you know, they're going to block something a little different. They're going to give us a little bit different formation than we've seen, something new. We've got to be able to handle that on the sideline and adjust to it. I think if we do that, you know, we, uh, we should, we'll have a chance to win the football game. Thanks to Coach Bateman and Coach Skrowski for talking to us for our regular segment here on Third Down Chirp Coordinator's Corner. Guys, from the Ball State perspective, who's the X factor when you're looking at this game Saturday afternoon that you believe is going to play a huge impact? Well, as Coach Bateman said, the way Army runs the triple option is they use three backs in the backfield, which makes it hard for them to go vertical on the edges with a, with a deep threat. But it's easier for them to run misdirection that way. So my X factor is the man in the middle, Joel Cox. He needs to be able to take on multiple box, hold his ground, and if he can get penetration, that'll kill any momentum they have with the triple option. My X factor is just to the right of Joel Cox, and that's Nathan Ollie, Zach, and the fact that 
He had a pretty big week last week against Illinois State, had a career high three tackles for loss. Last year against Army, had nine tackles in the game, one of them being a tackle for loss. He can be pretty disruptive if he's able to get in the backfield against that triple option offense. Apparently, there's only one position we're looking for here on third down trip <laughs> this week for X Factors. I'm going with Jonathan Newsom on that defensive line. Newsom had a productive day against Army in West Point, New York a year ago. He had eight total tackles. Four of them were all by himself, and two of them were tackles for loss. John and Newsom, always a huge impact for Ball State on that defensive line. Well, another guy that has an impact when he gets into the game for Ball State from a defensive perspective is Quinton Cooper. And for our Papa John Slice of Life segment, we talk to Quinton Cooper about what goes on in his world outside of Schumann Stadium. My name is Quinn Cooper. I'm from Dayton, Ohio. I play cornerback slash nickelback, and I'm a junior this year. I started when I was five years old. My mom uh, signed me up. Uh, my dad, he really wasn't that into it until I actually started playing, and uh, he found out that I was pretty good, so he ended up starting to come out to practice and watch me practice and all, and he ended up becoming a coach. I decided to come to Ball State because of really of uh, Stan Parrish. He really, uh, he really motivated me in coming. Uh, Ball State, they was my first offer. Uh, Ashley, when we first came here, uh, it was for the spring game, and he invited me into the office and said, like, did I have any offers? And I, and I said, no, I haven't received any offers yet. And he told me, well, son, I'm here to give you $140,000. And it was just me and my dad. In, the, uh, in his office and I just started crying because like I just knew all my hard work paid off. When the new coaching staff came, uh, you know, Coach Bateman, I got, you know what I mean, got real cool with him and then plus Coach Dixon stayed and of course Coach Limbo just because of his background, you know, he a winning coach and I knew he was going to come here and change things around, which he did and made the right uh, decision. So I remember in my freshman year, you know, we had we went four and eight my freshman year, and I looked up the last game, and shoot, it was like it was like this. It was empty, and now I mean, you know, I mean, when Coach Limbo and them came, we went six and six, and then last year we finished nine and four. And I mean, when you win games, the stands get full. You don't win games, the stands gonna look like that. So it's all about winning games, and that's what we here to do is to win games. I'm very happy that I came here. You know, what I mean, everybody don't get a chance to play Division One college football. And I'm just blessed every day I wake up to be able to say I'm a Ball State Cardinal. Huge thanks to Quentin Cooper for sitting down with us for our Papa John Slice of Life segment. Now, guys, we're in the closing stretch of our show. You know what that means. It's time for our final drive of the show as we go through all the MAC games this week. We're going through all of them, so we're going to give you our predictions, and we will start with a big one down in the Bluegrass State. As Miami of Ohio, they will go down and play at Kentucky. Both teams looking for their first win of the season. Zach, who do you have getting their first win? I like Kentucky at home, an SEC team at home. I think they handle it pretty easily. Kentucky lost last week to Western Kentucky. They've got Louisville next week. They get the job done. I think Kentucky gets the job done as well. Sorry, Miami of Ohio. Just don't think they're going to get the job done down there for Kentucky. Our next game on the docket, Eastern Michigan. They got their first win of the season a year, uh, just, just a week ago. Not a year ago, but a week ago against Howard. Can they get it done against Penn State in a Big Ten foe? Uh, I don't think they're going to get it done. I, I have Penn State in a route. It's going to be too tough to get it done. Penn State wins at home. I think Penn State, once again, sorry, Coach Ron English. I love you. You're a great guy. But unfortunately, I think Eastern Michigan is going to come up a little bit short in this game. Our third game we're looking at, Bowling Green and Kent State. Always a big rivalry game in the Mid-American Conference. Zach, do you have the Falcons or do you have the Flashes? I think this is going to be a really, really close and good game. But Bowling Green took care of Tulsa last week pretty easily. And Tulsa was predicted to win the Conference USA outright. I have Bowling Green in this one in a close one. I agree with you. It's a close game, but I've got the Flashes. I have the Falcons. I think Bowling Green, they're going to start off the year 2-0. and oh. Now let's go UMass and Maine. You look at this game and you think, ah, right, UMass should win it, right? Well, Maine, they've won three out of the last four meetings. Fellas, do they make it four out of five? I think Maine wins. UMass only got one win in 2012. Uh, uh, I think it's going to be around that total this year as well. I've got Maine on the road. Mac Power, I'm going with <laughs> UMass. UMass is going to pull out the win. I think they will finally, you know, buck the trend there and finally beat Maine for them from their perspective. Another game at the, another team at that FCS level, I should say, is New Hampshire. They are always up there in those rankings, 
They have Central Michigan. Central Michigan's coming off a tough loss against Michigan. Everybody loses at the big house, it seems like. Zach, does Central Michigan, do they chip their way back in and get a win? I think the Chippewas take care of business at home after that beat down by Michigan. I think they get the win. Well, this is New Hampshire's first game of the year. I think Central Michigan takes it at home. I have Central Michigan as well. I think they hold on. I think this will be a really good game, but Central Michigan edges out New Hampshire in the end of it. Toledo, it seems like they're a member of the SEC right now, not a member of the Mid-American Conference. They had to go to Florida first week, hung around, ended up getting beat. Do they hang around again and pull out a win this time, Zach? Well, I think it's going to be closer than the Florida game, but I think Missouri gets the win. It's going to be too much for Toledo to handle. I agree. I think it has the potential to be close, but I think Missouri will get it done because it's extremely tough to go to an SEC team and win. I, I, I have Missouri as well. It's going to be tough for Toledo to do it. Just a brutal start to their season. But just because they're 0-2, they're going to be tough for Ball State when they got to play in all the other Mid-American Conference teams. When you look at Baylor, they will host Buffalo. You think maybe just a couple weeks ago before this season started, you think Buffalo is going to get routed. They held on. They held their own against number two Ohio State. Do they hold their own and kind of eke out a win here at Baylor? I don't think they're going to get the win. I like Baylor in this one, but a, pe a person people should know about is Khalil Mack, the, the outside linebacker for Buffalo. He had eight tackles, two and a half sacks, an INT return for a touchdown against Ohio State. He's a player people need to keep their eye out on. Well, you see, Buffalo played a close game last week against Ohio, 40-20. to 20, They lost. But I think Baylor at home, number 23, I'm going with Baylor, Zach. I'm going to go with Baylor as well. It's just going to be tough for Buffalo going on the road. It's going to be a good experience for them. It looks like they're going to have a good team out there in Buffalo, New York. So watch out for the Buffalo Bulls. But unfortunately, they're just going to fall short and not come up and win this game. James Madison at Akron. This is another interesting game, another one of those unique FCS teams that are always up there. Do the Bulldogs of James Madison zip by Akron? <laughs> Luke, uh, I like Matt Power in this one. Let's go Zips. <laughs> I, I could see the potential for it to be close. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if James Madison does win in this game. But also, let's zip it up, Luke. Go Zips. <laughs> <laughs> wow, all these cliches. I'm sure, they, I'm sure Akron fans are loving it right now. But I'm going to have Akron as well. I think Akron, they will hold on. I'm not showing any disrespect to those James Madison Bulldogs. It will be close, but Akron will pull it out in the end. North Texas at Ohio. Oh, boy, the Bobcats had a rough start to their season. Teddy Bridgewater and Louisville pretty much threw and ran all over them. But looks like they could bounce back here. Do you see the Bobcats bouncing back against the Mean Green in North Texas? This is really our first glimpse of North Texas against a MAC team. And I, I like North Texas, Ohio on a short week. I'm going Mean Green. Well, I see a North Texas win. It hurts the MAC, but it helps Ball State because Ball State has them next week. But I've got the Bobcats in this one. I have the Bobcats rolling. They will roll. They will be mad after that Louisville game. They're going to stomp all over the mean green of North Texas. Sorry about that. I just <laughs> had to do that to you. And now Nickel State at Western Michigan. They got a saying up there in Kalamazoo, and it's row the boat. Stay together as a team. Had a rough start against Michigan State, a Big Ten foe. But do you think that Western Michigan can start rowing the boat in the right direction? I that? like Western pretty easily in this one over Nickel State. You know, they struggled to row the boat last week against Michigan State in the loss. But they row the boat. They get the win. I think Western Michigan, once again, they're going to row the boat just like these two up here. <laughs> they will get the win as well. All right, boys, now it's time for the game of the week. It's always our game of the week. It is Ball State. It will host Army 1 o'clock kick at Schumann Stadium. Zach, who do you have in this one? Are you going with the Black Knights? Or are they going to steal the thunder from Coach Limbo and the Cardinals? I don't think I'm going with the Black Knights, but I'll give you a more realistic score for my route this week. I, I like Ball State in this one pretty, pretty easily. I don't think it'll be very close at all this game. 45 to 17. See, the triple option in the backfield for the Black Knights is going to be something that Ball State's going to have to deal with and address on the defensive end. But I've got Ball State in this one, 38-21. Write it down, Zach. <laughs> well, we'll write it down, but write this score down. You'll want to keep this one. I think Ball State, it's going to be a good game, but I think they will pull away. I think they will beat Army 42-21. to This should be an interesting ball game. Angel Santiago seems like he's going to be finally that dual-threat quarterback. Army's going to run. That won't be a surprise. That won't be a shocker to anybody. But they may be able to throw the ball a little bit, but it will not be enough. I think the Black Knights fall short against Ball State. And the Cardinals march on, and they begin the season 2-0 as they head into North Texas next week. Well, that does it for this edition of Third Down Chirp. Once again, before we go, reminder, get us on Facebook and Twitter. Facebook, you can search us Ball State Sports Link for all the updates, not just on Ball State football, but all the Ball State athletic teams. And also for more information on Third Down Chirp, be sure to follow us on Twitter at Third Down Chirp. But once again, for all the updates on Ball State Athletics at BSU Sports Link. For everybody on the floor, for our producers, Drew Adamson and Alex Seitz, who do a phenomenal job putting this show together. And for Zach Hughes, Tyler Bradfield, 
I'm Luke Martin. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you again next week.